News drives markets. And every day, Montel's experienced reporters are on top of the stories that shape European market developments. Can you afford to miss out? Go to montelnews.com for the latest price driving stories and a free trial. Hello listeners and welcome to the Montel Weekly Podcast, bringing energy matters in an informal setting. Today's pod will discuss an important, at times controversial, part of the energy system, the certification of renewables, otherwise known as guarantees of origin or GOs. As the list of companies wishing to prove that they source only green energy continues to grow and as subsidies for renewables come to an end, GEOs are one of the main ways that firms can prove the energy they use is green. We will discuss prices, current market dynamics and the use of GEOs to decarbonise Europe's gas sector. I'm Richard Sorensen and joining me today is Alexandra Munzer, CEO of GreenFact, an analysis firm. A warm welcome to you, Alexandra. Thank you, Richard. Hello. I would like to give you a big compliment. That was really a perfect introduction for guarantees of origin. (laughs) Thank you, Alexandra. I I like to do my homework. I'd like to ask, first of all, about the current prices of guarantees of origin. Where are we and what are the main drivers? Well, Richard, you don't want to know. (laughs) (laughs) Yesterday, I saw 12 cents for the megawatt hour for uh, Nordic Hydro 2020. That's the prices lowest I've seen in uh, my four years career in <laughs> Green Fact. Wow. At the start of the year, they're about 45 cents, weren't they? Yeah, around 30 or something. It was at least a bit higher, but we've seen prices declining. So, I mean, a bit history, a bit story of uh, price development. It was, if you take... Fukushima, maybe as a starting point in 2011, then we saw a little bit prices of guarantees of origin going up because of the increased demand for renewables. Then we had around 30 cents per megawatt hour. And then for years and years, the price curve was relatively flat, I would say, between 25 and 20 cents per megawatt hour. And then something really beautiful happened in the end of 2017, prices started increasing until mid of 2018, where we had uh, the highest prices ever seen. We had two euros for Nordic Hydro and up to eight euros for Dutch wind guarantees of origin. And then beginning of 2019, the curve declined again and it uh, continued so until today where we see 12 cents for the megawatt hour. That's quite a crash. What are the main reasons for these very low prices, Alexandra? I would say if you look at demand supply curve, demand is definitely increasing year on year. We have an 8 to 10% increase of demand because, of course, all the energy companies are supplying more and more green electricity tariffs to their customers, households or industries. So this demand is picking up then we do see that uh, corporations are more and more committed to source their electricity from renewable sources. So this is definitely increasing. But then the guarantees of origin system has two reasons for growth in the supply as well. One is the, I would call it the natural increase in supply. So more and more renewables are deployed. So you have more wind energy, more solar energy. That is part of it. But then the European Guarantees of Origin works, I would say, over the AIB hub. That means the more European countries are connected to the hub, and not all of them are yet, the more supply comes into the market. And in 2019, for the first time, a law changed, so to say, in France. So all of a sudden, we saw auctions for supported renewable energy that was not there before. So they weren't in the market that added 45 terawatt hours to the market, a huge supply coming basically all of a sudden. And then this summer, we saw Portugal connected to the AIB, bringing another 13 terawatt hours on the table. And then also, of course, with Corona, less energy demand, so you need less GOs for the electricity suppliers. And then, yeah, you have the situation as we see it now. 
Mm. So the AIB, the Association of Issuing Bodies, that's right, that's the sort of Central European uh, Association. Correct. So the French auction obviously has had a huge impact. You're saying 45 terawatt hours coming in. What's happened with these auctions? Have people been been using them? Has there been a lot of uptake from them? Yes. I mean, it provides a sort of convenient uh, way to to source GOs, I would say, from the market. And we saw Italy has, has auctions or started with auctions. Then Luxembourg has auctions. France has auctions. And um, there was, it's a bit curious because the, how the market there is, and maybe we touch upon this later as well a bit, the UK sources for so-called CFD, FID exemption, tax exemption, basically, they can source, so utilities there can source GOs from the continent, basically, and if they fulfill certain criteria. And we see, for instance, if they participate in Italian auctions, that uh, a lot of the demand in these auctions comes from the UK. And we saw that in the beginning also in France. Mm. And then at some point, if you just look at the data, all of a sudden the auctions were not sold out anymore. So in the beginning, you sold, they sold all the volume and then lesser and lesser. And that had something to do with the, the UK. I think there was some some off gem press release that there are certain restrictions regarding import of French GOs in the UK and then all of a sudden this even the auction GOs weren't sold anymore. So that was really bearish sign, I would say, for the market. They saw, oh God, not even the auctions are sold out. <laughs> you know, it's the dreaded B word, Brexit. Will that have an impact here? I mean, will it cut off the flow of GOs from continental Europe, for example, France? I mean, we don't know the exact implications yet that we will have on the GO market, but if the Brexit, the result of the Brexit will be uh, or would be that guarantees of origin are not basically, quote unquote, allowed in the UK anymore, the continental ones, then you would lose about uh, 30 terawatt hours of demand annually that goes to the UK right now. And this would have an equal impact to friends auction coming in with the supply. So you would lose the demand that would have uh, that would be a quite huge impact. Yes, indeed. But is the shape of Brexit crucial here? I mean, a, a no deal maybe would have, you know, larger impact than than a kind of a soft Brexit, if you like. Yes, exactly. So we don't know yet what kind or how it will affect the GO market. I think the, the Brexit people involved have other problems with the economy to solve than uh, the guarantees of origin market. So I haven't heard of a clear decision yet how it will be. Yeah, I think the, the talk is more of fisheries and state aid and not guarantees of origin at the moment anyway. But um, obviously, you know, the greening of the system of green energy transition, if you like, is of crucial importance, I think. But, uh, you know, with they have huge plans in the UK for, for offshore wind development. But if we return to demand, you highlighted figures that showed in the first half of the year, you know, demand continue to rise despite the corona pandemic? I mean, what are the main drivers here? Where's the demand coming from? Yeah, the demand, I mean, we are now politically in a situation where the next three decades will be dedicated to making Europe the first carbon neutral continent on the planet with the Green Deal and uh, taxonomy and non-financial reporting that companies have to do now on an annual basis starting from next year. So this is of obviously one. So companies, in order to be competitive, they will have to tweak their sustainability measures or strategies and scope two emissions are part of that. But also, I mean, this is politics, this is um, what companies will have to do to be competitive. But obviously, we, when we see Fridays for Future, in order, if you are a B2C customer facing business, then of course, being green, doing something for the environment on many different levels plays a role. So we do, I mean, that is obvious. So the green shift uh, that also touches, of course, that has an impact on the guarantees of origin as well will become uh, more and more important. And that's why demand is increasing. You see this RE100 initiative. I just checked it for you yesterday. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, 263 members, big, big companies that are dedicated to source renewable electricity. Yes, this is big. And it continues to grow. I mean, that's what I think we've discussed on 
on earlier pods with you and with others that uh, the key to the green transition to this shift towards clean energy is getting the small and medium-sized companies on board as well. And this is one way of doing so. But you said, Alexandra, you've told me that you, you had a market survey recently. What does the general feeling towards prices next year? I should think the hope is that they, they rise higher than 12 cents. But what, what's the general feeling here for 2021? Yes, we do this annual uh, survey over the summer and ask market participants, can be producers, can be traders, uh, intermediaries, can be consumers. And in general, when it comes to pricing, we ask for prediction 2021, Nordic Hydro. And the most uh, respondents answered with a price between 10 and 30 cents and the median was 25 cents per megawatt hour. So this is uh, still uh, a bit more than 10 cents above what we have now. But there is no you know, quantum leap expected when it comes to prices because the market is aware of the supply coming in. But on the other hand side, the market is also aware that, that the demand is just uh, picking up every year as well. So not um, a massive leap, but uh, still doubling uh, from current levels. That's the feeling anyway from market participants. What, was there anything else that came out of your market survey? I mean, what do market players think about policies needed to, to strengthen the guarantees of origin market? That's a good question. And I think it's a really crucial question because we do see with a lot of supply coming into the markets and with the, some flaws a bit in the, in the nature of the system that um, there is a, a support needed uh, when it comes to legislation and the market participants. And also, I think um, when I talk to the creators, basically, of the market, the market designers, everyone is calling for something that is called full disclosure. That means uh, and standardization in the different EU countries, because as per EU law, every country needs to have a guarantees of origin system. However, there is a lot of freedom when it comes to the different member states. And um, this needs to be standardized so that trade gets easier, market participation in the market gets easier, things get more transparent and with full disclosure. That means that you have guarantees of origin, not only for renewable electricity, but also for any other type of uh, electricity source, may it be coal, nuclear, whatsoever. And the effect that this can have, we saw, for instance, I mean, Austria has this system. They have it in Switzerland. And when they implemented it in Switzerland, we saw prices, for instance, going up for Swiss Hydro because uh, with the implementation of full disclosure, Electricity suppliers were not allowed to have a certain amount of gray electricity. They had to really disclose to the end client, where is your electricity? Every, every megawatt hour, basically, where is it coming from? And when your end consumer sees that there is some, quote unquote, dirty electricity in their energy mix, they don't want it. And all of a sudden, the demand for renewables goes up. And this has a really nice effect. And if you have that all across Europe, that would help strengthening the system and the system's credibility a lot. You know, you gain trust and your transparency here is, is obviously very important. What needs to happen for full disclosure, as you say, to be in place? I mean, does this, is this part of the revision of the renewables directive? Is it, is it, does it have to come from the commission or is it more about a national, national regulators and, and national bodies? Yes, unfortunately, every all the market participants and uh, I think also the designers of the GO and the EECS system, they were hoping that it would be in the revision of the Renewable Energy Directive, but it, they, they didn't put it in there. So it's not there. And now it depends basically on every single member state if they want to have it or if they uh, don't want to have it. But in the end, I would say it needs to be a top-down uh, it needs to be in the revision of the Renewable Energy Directive so that every member state needs to do it. Otherwise, it won't happen. And that standardization, I think, is all important. So we're all, you know, we're all aware of what we're talking about rather than any sort of national divergences. I think that would certainly, that would help. So we're in, we're in the second wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, it seems that this situation may last quite a lot longer than was initially suspected. But I'd like to ask you about the impact on, on the guarantees of origin market, you know, how has Corona hit the, the trading of guarantees of origin? Yes, we see from our market survey, but also from the chats that we have with our clients and with the market participants in general, that COVID, of course, had a huge impact on, of course, the demand, because if there is less electricity demand, naturally less GO demand comes with this. 
and then the liquidity as well. And um, if you talk with market participants that used to trade in the guarantees of origin market, they're saying now they only do back-to-back -back deals. This means if a client has a request for a certain volume, they will go out in the wholesale market and procure this volume for them. So this is a huge impact on liquidity. That's unfortunately what we see right now. Okay. And what's the view then for next year? Will we have to come out of the pandemic for, for that to change? Depends. So when it comes to electricity demand, I would say to a certain extent, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and mm. I will see as soon as the economy picks up and, and uh, companies are out of their budget freezes, that it also is there, of course, when it comes to sustainability strategy and the way the companies want to go forward. As soon as we see an end of that, we will see, actually, I really believe all these uh, renewable shift uh, picking up quite quickly. And then we see it uh, back to a reasonable level again in the guarantees of origin market as well. I want to then maybe talk about another sort of potential ray of light here, Alexandra, for guarantees of origin. And that's their role in the decarbonization of the gas sector, because obviously with these very clear targets that are being currently being discussed in Brussels, net zero by by 2050, you know, a 60% cut in emissions by 2030. The role of gas is going to be crucial here and clean gas in particular. So what do these targets mean for, you know, the use of guarantees of origin in the gas sector? and clean gas in particular? This is definitely big. Alone, I mean, just in our market survey, we asked the uh, most important tools for decarbonization of Europe. And of course, there's the EU ETS, but one of the big ones was guarantees of origin for renewable gases. And this is clearly, if you look at the decarbonization efforts, renewable gases will, until 2050, substitute natural gas. <laughs> and we're talking a lot of natural gas consumption in whole Europe. And now we already have certification and so-called guarantees of origin in some countries and registries for that. But we don't have something like the AIB, like in hub, where we can cross-border trade easily among the different member states. That's not there, but it will come next year. We have next year. So we will see very similar to the system that we have for renewable electricity. We will see it in the renewable gas because it's basically you have it similar to the electricity grid. You have a gas grid and then all the similarities apply for guarantees of origin for gas. And it is in the red too. It is not only for biomethane, but also it includes at the later stage uh, hydrogen as well. So this is really interesting. And when I talk with uh, the industry, corporations that are actively engaged, of course, in the green PPA, in the CPPAs, they, they have long-term agreements for renewable electricity. During the summer, when no one could travel, they all did their homework when it comes to their natural gas consumption, how to green it. And they were really asking me, okay, in the first stage, they would like to procure a green gas certificate. And then at the later stage, they are also looking if it's viable to have PPAs for green gas. So uh, this will be um, huge, I think, in the next, in the coming years. So um, green gas PPAs, that's uh, extraordinary. But what could the policymakers and the commission learn then from the experiences so far in, in the electricity market for the guarantees of origin for electricity? And what can they then take to the revision of the Renewable Energy Directive? What can they learn from the renewable electricity market? Well, first, or I, what should they do differently? Or you know, differently. I I'm not sure if we will get uh, if there will the same problems will arise that we have in the electricity uh, renewable electricity geos. But um, what is crucial and what is easier than for the gas people, so to say, is that they can learn. Uh, they already have the AIB and the hub and how it works with the cross border trade of certificates. And they can just copy more or less the system and transpose it to uh, renewable gases. So I think this starting and, you know, building up the system will happen much, much quicker than we've seen for renewable electricity. And this is already a huge advantage, but we have to start with this first. And of course, what can they learn? Standardization, make it as simple as possible. In my opinion, don't give the member states too much freedom to do their own thing, but there will be um, 
yes, we will see a very similar system to what we have now in electricity. And we also, what I what I see now, we do have uh, far higher prices, of course. We have uh, for the megawatt hour of gas at the moment between 6, 8 to 15 euros per unit per certificate. So this is a very, really interesting market. Absolutely. And with the prospect of higher carbon prices, this would certainly make uh, green gas very, very viable. Absolutely. There's huge prospects for, for growth for guarantees of origins there. And I, I can see that, uh, you know, for green hydrogen and for, for biogas, this is a very exciting prospect then. So thank you very much, uh, Alexandra, for your insights and your views o- on this market, even though maybe they are low price at the moment, but uh, the, the future seems to be uh, very promising. So thank you again, Alexandra, for joining the, the Monta Weekly podcast. Thank you, Richard. That's all for this week. But you can now follow the podcast on our own Twitter account called the Montel Weekly Podcast. Please direct message any suggestions, questions, or let us know if you'd like to be a guest. You can also send us an email to podcast at montelnews.com. Lastly, remember to keep up to date with all that's happening in the energy markets on Montel News. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. And please rate and review us if you can. That helps us to improve. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.